So, the newest episode of Dark Side of the Ring just wrapped up about 20 minutes ago. It is now 10.21 uh, p.m. on this Thursday, the last day in September 2021. And this episode was on um, Onita's um, FMW. It was called Blood and Wine, Onita's FMW. And I'll say this, it is one of the most craziest darkest uh, stories uh, that you're going to get this season and it's not just you know based on some individual that you know competes in the business or competed in the business but it's based on how a promotion you know rose to prominence and then fell from that prominence and it, it is it is a roller coaster I'm going to tell you that I mean it, it goes through um, you know Onita's history as a wrestler like Onita was basically one of the high flyers, like one of the first high flyers um, internationally, you know, Jap Japan wise and, you know, world worldwide, worldwide wise, if you will, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, he was one of the first ones. And unfortunately, what happened is he was um, getting ready to leave the ring after a match, a championship match, I think, for all Japan. And he ended up coming off the ring, you know, basically coming down from the ring apron, you know, kind of like, you know, normally what wrestlers would do, just jump off the ring apron and, you know, walk off to the back. Uh, but when he did it, you know, after his match, he jammed his knee. He jammed it so bad, he said he could see the bone sticking out. And that pretty much ended um, his high-flying portion of his wrestling career. It pretty much brought it to a close. So, basically... You know, for a time, it looked like his wrestling career overall was done. And then he decided, you know what? You know, he, he wants to do something more. You know, he wants to do something more. He wants to continue wrestling and, and all that. And it was during various tours um, here in the States. I think this was before and even after his injury. Where he discovered, hey, hardcore wrestling you know, it gets people excited, it gets them really pumped and overzealous and into into the action. And he says this because he he took part in that, one of those uh, concession stand bra bras in Tennessee. Uh, one of those concession bras uh, in Tennessee. And basically he was doing this as he was trying to go over the concession, uh, go back, you know, towards the ring, tries to climb over the, one of the concessions. A lady kicks him in the face not once but twice with her heel and the second time it kind of cuts him open on the face and then that's when he gets this revelation of ooh you know people like this kind of wrestling and like I said this was you know between the time he was you know uh, going you know I think that what I'm trying to say is I think this was between the time as I mentioned earlier uh, before and after his injury that he did these tours and it was mostly after his injury that um, he decided, okay, you know, I still acknowledge that hardcore wrestling is something that gets people excited. So he decided to put on a match against a karate master, an actual karate master, and fight against him. You know, basically karate, mixed martial arts kind of guy uh, against, against him in a series of matches. And... It was basically doing these that he pretty much had more confirmation that he that he needed, or pretty much started to get the confirmation he needed to go through with what he wanted to do, and that was FMW. And FMW was basically the ended up overall uh, FMW became overall the third largest, if not at times second largest wrestling promotion in Japan. And it was because of the hybrid style that was brought you know with it because not only did you have uh, martial arts at times you know that's part of the name but you also had you know high flying wrestling technical wrestling women's wrestling and of course the one signature thing about it that really you know put it on the map was the hardcore wrestling but the way they did hardcore matches was you know not what you know you would expect um, here in the States, you know, or would expect later on here in the States. You know, what they were doing at that time was 
you know, unfathomable and unimaginable. I mean, you know, they did a a, a comparison, you know, between you know what was going on there with FMW and what was going on here in the states with the likes of WWE, WWF at the time, and WCW, which was still under the NWA banner. And they basically compared the fact that here you had, you know, WWF, which was kind of like a, a, a menagerie of characters and, and, and talent. And you had WCW that was getting a little crazy at times, of it being a little bit more of a hybrid of, you know, gimmicks and, you know, kind of a hardcoreness once in a while, and, and w along with real wrestling. And then on the other side of the pond, you have FMW that was doing uh, matches that basically no one even thought was happening here in the states. No one ever thought about it. And yet they were occurring. You know, they were they were happening. I mean, to give you kind of an example, one of the years they were one of the years they were showing was around 89, 90 or eight, between 89 and 93. And we know how WWF was at that time between 89 and 93, the characters they had and, and all that. Compare that style of sports entertainment, wrestling, whatever you want to call it, to what you were getting, you know, in contrast in Japan with FMW. Totally different environment, totally different scenario. It's like night and day. You know, it's like, here's the day represented by WWF, and here's night represented by FMW. It's like, they, you know, things just don't add up. Things don't, you know, equal out. And that's how different, you know, FMW was. Even at a time, like when I was 10 years old, where you still had over-the-top characters. You know, cartoon-like characters in WWF. Where you had that, you know, kind of hybrid style of wrestling, legit wrestling, and, you know, over-the-top characters in WCW when it was under, under the NWA banner. You know, you had, you know, you had, you know, amongst all that, you had this company in Japan that was totally, totally, you know, like, un unlike anything anybody had ever seen. And it was, it was wild. It was really, really wild uh, when you think about it. Um, so... What was crazy uh, about this, though, what's crazy about this is, like I said, you take a look at the time frame and what FMW was doing, contrast to what you know we our companies were doing here. It's like uh, imagine if Vince, Mc, imagine if Jack Tunney, who was the on-screen authority figure, came out and said. Hulk Hogan is gonna take on Sergeant Slaughter an exploding ball boy match at WrestleMania 7. Imagine everybody's reaction being like, Excuse me, what you say? They're gonna have what? They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. And here's the thing Hogan and Slaughter always, you know, on house show loops and all that, would have boot camp match, uh, yeah, boot camp matches, if you will. You know, and those matches were hardcore enough. But, like I said, imagine if you had someone like Jack Tunney take a page out of Anita's book and say, the main event at Mania is going to be that. <sighs> you mean, with, you know, the rumor going around that people wanted to blow up, you know, bomb Sergeant Slaughter's house because of the way he was you being portrayed and everything, not realizing that it was an act. And the fact that, you know, despite what you want to believe, moving it from the L.A. Memorial Coliseum to... The sports arena, can you imagine how people would react if they heard that was going to happen? <laughs> Talk about people being like, hey, you know what? We don't have to bomb his house. He'll get blown up anyway. <laughs> it's just just crazy. Just crazy to think. But yeah, that's that's how big of a difference, how big of a, that's how big of a cultural difference, culture difference, I'm trying to say, you would have between FMW and WWF and WCW and even AWA that was still around at that time. You know, they, they were on the last legs, but they were still around. But, yeah, the one thing that was always consistent about Onita, from what everybody they've talked to, from Mick Foley, T 
Terry Funk, Ricky Fuji, to um, Hayabushi's daughter, to um, it was Shorin uh, Ar Arin's Ar eyes, uh, the daughter of Shor uh, Shell. Her name is Shell. She was the daughter of the ring announcer uh, that took over as the new owner of the company. You know, they they talked to everybody, and a lot of them were always uh, in agreement. You know, and they even I think they did I say they could talk to Chris Jericho. Yeah, they talked to Chris Jericho because he he competed in FMW, not in the death matches, thank God, but he would compete on the cards where some of these matches, these wild, insane matches, would take place on. And one and one thing they all had basically in common when talking about Onita and his company is, and Ricky Fuji said it best. You know, because he said, and Ricky, Ricky Fuji, I gotta say this, he stole the show here. I, I liked him. He was very charismatic. Um, you know, they gotta, you know, if I'm AEW, I bring this guy in and I do something with him. Make him a manager, maybe Hokaro Oshida or something. Uh, what, what, whatever the case is. But basically, Ricky Fuji, I thought was great here. Uh, but anyway, anyway, uh, Ricky Fuji, I think, said it best, and everybody pretty much said something similar throughout. You know, when Onita would go into, you know, after a match, Onita would, you know, cry a little bit because he was... The one thing about Onita, and Onita said it himself, is, you know, you have to get your audience to feel what you're feeling, to know how you're reacting, so that if you're feeling pain, they feel pain. And he was a master at it. He was obviously a master at it. Uh, and oh, they talked to Sabu as well. They talked to Sabu. And... Um, like I said, all of them kind of basically said what Ricky Fuji said. And that is, after a match, Onita would cry a little bit so his, you know, people would feel his pain through victory or defeat. And then he would go into an ambulance to go to the hospital or whatever to get stitched up and, you know, looked out for wounds and everything. And he would, um, according to Ricky Fuji, he'd be like, you know, and, and this is how he envisioned Onita. Because, and again, like I said, everybody was very, you know, thinking, basically were complimenting on the same level of Onita's mindset would be, okay, what's next? Like, how do I top what we just did? And he would come up with other crazy scenarios. Like, he would come up with a barbed wire match. You know, that's obvious. It's been done here in the, in the States, you know, through NWA, WCW, back in the late 80s, you know, mid to late 80s, early 90s. But, you know... You know, but the thing is, it's re it was rarely seen. It was done only like it was only done for like special events, like Clash of the Champions or pay per views. So, you know, there was that. But the thing is, that was consistent with Anita. Like I said, according to a lot of people, is he always wanted to top himself. So okay, he does a barbed wire match. Okay, fine. How do we top that? Oh, let's electrify the barbed wire, and they would do that. And they're like, okay, how can we top electrifying the barbed wire? Oh, I know. Let's set the barbed wire on fire. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much what happened. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it on YouTube, here on YouTube a lot and everything, but that's basically what happened. So, long story short, Onita, um, according to what Sabu said, Onita, w Onita would take care of... Uh, the Japanese people, like Onito and, every, and and other wrestlers there, would take care of the Sheik and the talent and like and talent like Abdul or the Butcher, and you know when they would go over there and compete, it would take good care of them. So Anita's like, you know, hey, I got this idea for a match, Sheik. You know, me and Tarzan Gota, uh, me and Tarzan uh, Gota, uh, uh, Goto, me, me and Tarzan Goto, against you and a partner of your choice, and the Sheik picked Sabu and Sabu was like hey he, he could have picked anybody else but he chose me he said I'll bring my nephew and like I said Sabu's saying hey he could have picked anybody but he chose me and basically they and, and the Sheik at that time the Sheik at that time was 65 years old 65 years old in the, this was like around 93 so Basically, they have this match because again, Onita always wants to top himself, and one of the ways he would top himself is, you know, by trying to see what else he could do with barbed wire or any kind of, you know, hardcore con environment. And in this case, he said, "Let's set the rings on fire," and it got out of control. 
because the more they set it on fire, the more it, it the more it engulfed everything. It, it it basically was as Chris Jericho put it in the confidential sneak peek several weeks ago. Uh, it was an inferno, and Sabu said he had to roll out of the ring, and what he did, he got a bucket of water, started tossing it. You know, Onita ta got out, Taz and Goto got out, but the one person that they felt didn't get out, but he got out the other end, uh, was the Sheik. But the Sheik, he got out because he was, you know, he had barren, he didn't roll out like Sabu did. He was crawling out, so he got, you know, second degree burns on 60% of his skin. And, uh, and Sabu, according to what he says, he's trying to throw water on his uncle's back because it, it's peeling off because of the burns. And then the one quote he said was that during the match, everybody's hands and elbows and stuff melted into the FMW logo in the middle of the ring. That's how bad it got. And I'm thinking to myself, and you know, and I'm thinking to myself, honestly, and people want those kind of matches here in the States? You know, it's like, you know, one, it's crazy to see what GCW's doing. It's crazy to see what CZW's doing. It's crazy to see what IWA Mid-South is doing. Seriously, you want those kind of matches here? You out of your mind. But yeah, it's yeah, it's one of those situations. One of those situations, and and when they interviewed Mick Foley, he talked about how even the women were not were not uh, basically when they talked to Mick, you know, he said not even the women were an exception here because he remembers seeing a match where there was electrified. Uh, exploding ring match between two women and then during this match one of the ladies got burned basically the one of the other ladies blew a freaking fireball an enormous an enormous fireball at this woman and that basically she was screaming in pain even as he was getting ready to go to the match and she was obviously in the back screaming still in pain a little bit but it got so bad according to what Mick said that her clothes melted into her skin or at least burned into her skin melted into her skin it was that bad from that fire from that big old fireball blown at her as well as thanks to the electrified bomb bar match the two ladies were in it, it, and this is fmw in the early to mid 90s you know this is at a time mind you this is at a time when you know wwf is still very cartoonish wcw is kind of getting there but not totally but once Hogan shows up they are but this is around that kind of a time frame where you know they were kind of cartoonish here you had ECW that was trying to be the underground rebel rebel basically like the miniature version of FMW but not there yet uh, not there yet obviously not there yet but they were trying to get there or they were at least attempting to get there with some of the matches they had and in between all this you have FMW that basically, again, nobody even knew these kind of matches were happening until a lot later on. You know, a lot later on. It's like, I mean, imagine, imagine you're Mick Foley. You're still working for, you know, WCW at that time. And you're getting to go over to Japan and compete in some crazy, and compete in some matches for New Japan, Old Japan, and FMW. Imagine you're Mick Foley, you're coming back to WCW, Eric Bischoff, whoever's in charge, is looking at you going like, what the hell happened to you? And you have to explain to them, oh yeah, I was in this match, you know, over there on the six-man tag. Imagine what Bischoff's face is like. He's probably like, say what? <laughs> you know, because he, you know, at the time he's not thinking about, okay, how crazy can we get? He's thinking about how can we be the top dog in the country, in the world, as professional wrestling, as far as professional wrestling is concerned. So yeah, he's not thinking, you know, along those lines. He's just like, what am I doing sending some of these guys there to compete in these kind of matches? Anyway, anyway, long story short, they just talk about how crazy and how crazier and crazier things would be. I mean, they show footage of Onita and Tarzan Goto Competing in an electrified barbed wire cage match. That would go, that when you would hit the cage, it would go off and explode. They talked about electrified pool matches where the, where the pool, where the ring would be in the middle of the, of the, of the harbor. Where basically you would have to take a boat from the harbor into the middle of the river, or the middle of the lake, where the ring would be set up. And 
you know, you would have your match there and basically it would be electrified pool matches or exploding pool matches. It's like, what? It's like this guy, Onida, and like I said, going back to what Ricky Fuji said, and everybody was pretty much in agreement during those separate interviews, he always wanted to top himself. He always wanted to try to top himself. So yeah, there was a lot going on. But the one thing that really surprised a lot of people doing this was how involved the Yakuza was. Yeah, the Yakuza, the Japanese version of the Mafia. You know, they would basically run the arenas where FMW and probably other Japan promotions like New Japan and All Japan would be at. You know, they would block off certain sections of the front row so that only they sat there and nobody sat with them. I mean, these guys are the kind of guys, if you've heard all the stories about them, no matter what they'd be involved in, are not the kind of guys you want to mess with. You do what they say and nobody will be hurt, pretty much. Well, Sabu pretty much found out that you don't mess with these guys because, you know, during a match, you know, he gets clotheslined over, according to dramatization, he gets clotheslined over the rail and into the Yakuza. And then he gets back over the rail. But then what happens afterwards is he realizes, oh shit, what did I just do? He tries to run. He tries to leave to get out of there before anything can happen, but he gets trapped. And then he gets start beat and they start beating on him they start taking him down beating on him kicking him trying to hurt him if not kill him and thankfully mike austin was there to save his act to save his butt you know by tossing him around and you know tossing the yakuza around to you know get him off sabu and sabu always was grateful to mike since then because it's like you know my basically mike what he was doing was not only saving sabu's butt but he was trying to basically send a message to the yakuza uh, hey, this guy didn't mean to do what he did, so you don't have to take it out on him. <laughs> but, yeah. It's a crazy story. It is a crazy story. And then they get to when uh, Anita decides he's going to retire, and his last match, retirement match, is going to be an electrified barbed wire cage against Hayabushi, who has competed in ECW before. So, um, that was, you know, if you ever saw one of the ECW pay-per-views where it was Hakushi, under his uh, Japanese name, uh, competing there uh, and teaming with Hayabushi, you know, you got to, you know, see something once in a lifetime, according to what a lot of people said. But, you know, Onita said that Hayabushi was basically out of his out of his element. Because it's like, yeah, this guy is the guy, because basically what it was is he saw Hayabushi as probably, his, probably the successor the next big star for the company but he also knew that you know Habushi was Habushi was you know out of his element and it showed in the match and they even had a footage after the match well after how after um, Onita won it was, you know his last match that is he told Habushi who's laying on the floor mask off and everything because it was that hardcore of a match he said never never let me come back to the ring never and then this is where he basically lets, I think, the Yakuza or, you know, some of the people in charge that he's working with know that he's stepping away, he's going away from wrestling. And they're like, well, you know, who's going to be the next president? Well, he's asking basically, who are you going to put in charge? Who do you want to be put in charge? And then they choose the ring announcer. And basically, that's where everybody agrees, you know, uh, this was a big mistake. You know, this was a big mistake because, you know, now, Shell, that's her name, the, the daughter of the ring announcer, said that she, basically she says that she feels Onita may have set her father up, you know, to take the fall. Um, but I, th I think you can kind of tell that maybe she kind of believes it, but she doesn't. You know, so, you know, that's kind of like, you know, that's kind of how you have to look at it. Like, she, you can tell she kind of believes it, but part, part of her doesn't. You know, so, it's, it's kind of like, if you were to look her straight in the eye and be like, do you really believe that? You know, and she'd probably be like, uh, I, you know, she probably wouldn't give you an answer. And what's funny is Shell, Shell, I think Shell, basically, she spoke very fluent English. Very good English. Riki Fuji spoke some decent English, even though they had to put subtitles for him. They both spoke very well. So I was surprised by that. Uh, no offense, though. No offense. But anyway, you know, when they, you know, made the uh, ring announcer the new president, the new owner... 
it was basically like they knew everybody pretty much being interviewed in this knew it was a mistake they knew it was a mistake because as the story goes he was starting to slowly go away from the deathmatch style of wrestling and more into the sports entertainment aspect of it more like here's just plain old wrestling with maybe occasional deathmatch but more entertainment wise and they also talked about he hired on somebody else uh, I can't think of his name right now um, it was I can't think of it right now it was somebody but he was more of a he was basically the WEW the world entertainment wrestling champion was the top guy there and he brought him in to do the booking and the creative stuff it was his name was Fujika or Fujika or something like that Fu, Fujika or something and according to Ricky Anytime you would want to uh, um, ask something to uh, Ana, uh, the, um, or uh, the guy that was running FMW now, or uh, running FMW after Onita, when they would ask him, you know, what if he had any advice, what to do, he would say, ask Fujika, or ask Fujinaka, or ask Fujinaka. And Fujinaka would come back and say, do this, do this, do this, do this. Basically, Fujinaka, along, uh, along with Ari's, uh, blessing, Harai, uh, Ari's blessing. I think that's what his last name was. Um, basically, was like the Vince McMahon of of Japanese wrestling. Uh, he'd basically taken um, FMW from its deathmatch origins into sports entertainment. And even Onita's like, this is not what I wanted FMW to be like. So Onita, one year after wrestling, and then trying his, you know, trying his. Uh, you know, um, Stark at trying his, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, trying his uh, legs at uh, acting, you know, one year afterwards, he came back and he came back as a heel. He said, I wanted to come back as a heel, be a bad guy, knowing that, you know, Habushi's the top star here for FMW, the new FMW. And they would show Habushi and others say, hey, support the new FMW. They would try to get the fans to support. So he came back as a heel. And he knew that in Tokyo, people would cheer, cheer Hayabushi, and he would be the heel, naturally, he'd be booed. But then in the smaller rural areas, uh, he would be cheered, because he was a big star. He was a bigger name in Hayabushi. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically, it was one of those situations that, like, nowadays, you look at some guys trying to be pushed as baby faces, and, you know, people just want to boo them. It's like, just let them boo them. Let them be heels. You know, you kind of saw that here with Onita. It's like Onita knew, okay, if I go here, I will be booed because people love Hayabushi in Tokyo and places like that. But if we go to the smaller rural areas or smaller towns and cities, people are going to probably, people will, you know, people, uh, basically he said people were cheering him and booing Hayabushi. So anyway, uh, long story short, they get to the moment which Hayabusha's career ended. He... One of the moves he does is kind of like a lion salt. He goes off the middle rope and he tries to hit a lion salt and if he doesn't, he gets back up. Well, he, he goes for it, but he lands awkwardly right on his neck. Like he's flipping and boom, he hits his neck awkwardly and he can't move. And you see everybody's wondering, oh my God, what happened here? What's going on? Everybody's worried. And that's when they find out basically he's paralyzed. He's paralyzed and his career is essentially over. And his daughter, you know, uh, basically said that he felt like, you know, he wasn't sure what was going to happen next, but, you know, he knew his career was over. But she said that even during his rehabilitation, he would keep fighting. Like he, you know, like Anita, he didn't want to stay away. He wanted to try to come back. And so he would keep fighting and he would keep fighting, but he was, you know, paralyzed. And, and they did show footage of him at a, what was it, a... Uh, a WMF event, I think is what it's called, you know, getting up and walking via crutches because he was determined to walk again. And then they got into uh, his, pa then they got into the fact that a year after he did that, you know, he ended up uh, passing away a year after he did that at the age, I think about 47, 42, 47, I think. So they said basically, you know, he, you know, even though he had his moment, he, he passed away the following year after that moment. Um, now, as far as the new owner of FMW goes, he was he was getting into a lot of debt. He was getting into a lot of debt to the point that 
you know, Anita's, you know, Anita said it himself. He's like, you know, why, you know, why didn't this guy just come back, you know, come to me and ask for money or something like that, and, you know, and I could have helped him. It's because, according to what he said, uh, Ari or I or whatever his name last name is, he was too proud. He was just too proud to come back to, you know, to ask Anita to help him out, and, you know, he ended up doing things that he shouldn't have done. Like he started taking money. This is what uh, Shell said uh, from her reaccount, from what her mother would tell him. I guess her mother told her that he would take money from the family, from the family. He would basically take, you know, family, the family's own money to play, pay off these debt. And the mother would be like, no, no. And it just got to a point that the mother's like, you know what, screw this. I can't live with this anymore. And she divorced him and took Shell with her. Or at least, yeah, they, she took Shell with her and everything. And it got to the point, unfortunately, where one day, uh, Ari, Ari, or whatever his name is, uh, took his own life. He basically, you know, got a rope, hung it in a tree in a schoolyard, and hung himself. He killed himself because he couldn't take it anymore. And Onita, and this is one of the things that Chris said was one of the most cold-hearted things he had seen. You know, Onita's like... You know, he's talking about it, and he, you know, basically, he lights up a cigarette, and he says, look, you know, you can get away from debts. You just tell him you can't pay, and there you go. Um, unfortunately for Shore Ori's um, family, I think that's what his name was, um, the debt still had to be paid. And what happened, what happened is the Yakuza... Because Sabu said it best. He said, you can take your own life. You can leave this world, if you will. You could leave this world, you know, all you want. You could leave this world. But, you know, in the end, in the end, you know, basically, your debt still has to be paid to the Yakuza. And they're going to make your family pay because your debt will be passed on to them. And according to what Shell says, basically what happened one day is they came into the house, they locked they changed the locks, they changed the keys, and they locked them out of the house because the house was to pay back for the debt. Now, thankfully, the, I'm, I'm assuming that, I'm assuming, thankfully, they got the house back later on, but because of the fact that, you know, the debt had to be paid, the house and everything in it was taken away from them, and again, I'm assuming they may have gotten it back. I'm, I'm not totally sure yet, but yeah, and, you know, this is where, this is the part of the of an episode where she kind of blames Onita a little bit for maybe setting her father up. But again, you can kind of tell maybe she's not totally believing that to be true, but it's something to really it's something for her to, to go on right now until maybe she can get some truth and uh, I guess you could say um, justification down the line. Now, um, after that, FMW of course closed up because it, you know even before he took his life, Rick Fu Ricky Fuji was trying to see, went to him seeing if he can get paid. Uh, he said he basically got to the point that he didn't, Ricky Fuji said, I didn't get paid. Um, you know, they, and they even talk about during the episode where Onita was brought in for a meeting, um, uh, you know, between the talent and the new owner that, you know, took over his, uh, um, his job title as owner. And the new own, and the new owner, Arai, the one that took his life later on, the one that took his own life later on, told Onita, quit. FMW, please quit FMW, go, leave. Because I think what was happening is he started to notice fans were cheering him and booing Hayabushi, and the roles were not supposed to be that way. So he wanted Onita out. And I think he was afraid Onita might have an influence on how matches would go. But anyway, yeah, it's, but anyway, this episode overall is just one of the darker behind the scenes looks at how, you know, wrestling promotions back then. You know, on you know, especially the ones that are looked at as outlaw, hardcore, crazy deathmatch style promotions. You know, just how you know out of hand they can get, not just in front of the camera and in front of the audience, but behind the scenes. And I do recommend you watch this. They do put a warning saying that it's uh, un this is going to be uncensored. It's going to be an uncensored uh, episode. They put on the TVMA VL. Uh, rating for it, you know, because 
it was one of those episodes that really you just gotta you know if you're very squeamish you just gotta you know really just mm, you know you know gut it out if you will you really just gotta gut it out or something or you just have to take your time and watch it you know that's how it is now they did talk about how FMW came back in 2015 uh, temporarily uh, I think for a reunion deal or something like that and then that was it uh, I'm surprised they didn't talk about the fact that now FMW has come back again uh, and they're just starting out smaller right now and Onita's back in charge uh, just like he was for that one time uh, that short uh, uh, resurgence in 2015 now they're back again and again Onita's back in charge so so yeah, it's like I said, it's one of the crazier episodes um, that you're going to to see out of Dark Side of the Ring. And like I said, it's one of the rare episodes where they give you a warning before it comes on of how violent it's going to be, and the fact that it's going to have a TV MAVL rating. You know, just for the fact that I mean, because when you watch the imagery and you hear, you know, a lot of the thing, you you see the imagery, or you see the footage from some of the matches, you know, then and. You know, you hear, as well as the images, and then you hear about what happened behind the scenes and stuff, and it's like, yeah, is this any episode that deserves to up the ante from 14 to MA? It's it's this one. It's definitely this one. And, uh, yeah, I do recommend watching it, but if you're screamish, I would say take your time in watching it. But if, you really, if you're really if you really a fan of hardcore deathmatch wrestling, you know, check this out. I mean, even O'Neill credits himself for being the one that really brought hardcore wrestling to the masses <laughs> globally because of FMW. You know, he even talks to, and again, they and and they do talk about the match he had with Terry Funk, you know, the exploding ring match, and you know, you get the iconic line there that was shown in the confidential sneak peek, where Terry Funk is like, "Yeah, here's the audience. You know, they're coming to see an exploding barbara but death match. Oh, I want a front row ticket. Bullshit. <laughs> you know, that, that's what he said. It's like bullshit." And, you know, the reason Terry said it that way is because, yeah, you want a front row ticket, I do not envy you. <laughs> you know, it's like, I would not want to be in the front row when that uh, when that ring explodes, and I'm in agreement, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's just one of those situations, and, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is just one of those situations to where when you watch something like this, and you get a better, it's afterwards you get a better understanding of how, Hardcore wrestling became what it was in Japan, and how it influenced down, and how it influenced the Western part of wrestling uh, as well down the line, like ECW and all that. You, you bet, I mean, after this, you get that better understanding as to why fans crave it, because according to Anita, you know, it, you know, it makes them, it gets them excited, it, it, it energizes them, it makes them overzealous, and it makes them craving and wanting more. So, yeah, it's just one of those unique but yeah it's just one of those episodes that again you have to see it to, to believe you know what was talked about here and that's all i'm going to say uh, next week they're going to talk about johnny k9 bruiser beldrum as he was known in smoky mountain wrestling they're going to talk about his history his life his double life basically in and out of the ring and that might be, and that's probably going to be an intriguing episode uh in itself and we'll just see you know see where they go from there afterwards i mean we i know they have luna and they have xpw coming up booze of Beldrum, as well as they got the steroids trial um so we'll see what they uh, come up with after booze of Beldrum. i'm assuming the next one they're going to come up with is maybe luna because if they're going to do xpw i think xpw will be second to last before they get to the steroids trial uh but Anyway, guys, that's all I'm going to say on this review of the newest episode of Dark Side of the Ring, on Oni which was entitled Blood and Ryan, Onita's FMW. Let me know what your thoughts are down below. Comment if you like. I'd love to hear from each and every one of you. Live chat during the premiere. Like the video. Check out the Teespring store. Check me out at Patreon at BW Roses Brian Warmer. Check me out at BW Roses Discussions on all your favorite podcast locations except for uh, Pandora. And that's audio podcast, that is, except for Pandora. So let's check me out on Vimo for some video content that you can't get here on YouTube due to copyright reasons uh, itself. Like, you know, certain PMVs or AMVs and stuff like that. Uh, but till next time, guys, take care. God bless. I am out. Peace.